Thank you very much, Fleur. Um, so it's really so wonderful to see you all. Um, I'm thrilled that you're here and we're going to have a great day. Uh, I usually get incredibly excited when I get presenta give, uh, give presentations, so um, I hope that doesn't put you off. <laughs> OK, all right. So let's see how we're going here. All right. So I was preparing this talk last week, and last week was a pretty big week for the climate. Um, what we saw come out was the sixth um, IPCC report on the state of the climate. Um, those reports started in 1988, and this most recent report um, is informing us that we are in very big trouble. Um, and basically, the message from that uh, report was that we need serious climate action and we need it on all fronts, and we need it everywhere. We need everything, everywhere, all at once. So this is uh, really the big picture that is driving uh, climate change, uh, sorry, driving change in agriculture at the moment. Um, and I just want to go into some depths of the history of um, some of Australia's uh, climate policies um, and uh, actions um, spanning two decades that are uh, supporting ag uh, the whole Australian economy to decarbonise and also talk about where agriculture fits in this picture. So every sector of every economy everywhere must decarbonise at pace now. And agriculture is no exception. Global food systems represent 34% of global greenhouse gas emissions. We will see on the right of this slide here um, the emissions uh, profile of the US and China. So this is total economy-wide emissions. And you'll see that land and energy are almost equal um, in their emissions footprints in both of these economies. Uh, now, unfortunately, the very excellent report that this came from uh, lumped Australia in with Oceania, so we don't have, I don't have that uh, granularity of detail for Australia, but I would suspect that it would be quite similar. So, globally, uh, agriculture is responsible for 18,000 million tonnes of carbon dioxide emissions every year. And in agriculture alone, so if we're just looking, or, or food systems alone, so let's just look at that land sec sector component of the graph there, 71% of that is related to agriculture and land use, um, which is directly under the control of farmers. So farmers really have a very big and important role to play in this de decarbonisation task. So moving on, and this goes back, uh, right back to the 2000s, and some of the very early uh, policy and programs and interventions that the Australian government established to decarbonise the energy sector. So many of you would be familiar with uh, residential solar PV rooftop installations, um, which over the last 10 years have accelerated at an enormous pace. I think we're moving up to, in some places, some states, nearly 33% of households have solar power. And that's just incredible. Um, now, this is also occurring in large-scale energy production. So part of Australia's uh, energy emissions reduction policy involved something called the Renewable Energy Target. Uh, and then the renewable energy target was implemented in around 2010 with a target to achieve uh, 33,000 gigawatts of renewable power uh, by 2020. And that policy achieved that in 2021. It was supported by legislation <coughs> called the Renewable Energy Act of 2000 and administered by the Clean Energy Regulator. The sector has also received significant government support 
um, to agencies investing in uh, new renewable energy technologies. The Clean Energy Finance Corporation, established in 2012, has already invested $10 billion in this sector. And then we have the Clean Energy Finance Corporation, um, sorry, the, um, sorry, that Australian Renewable Energy Agency, um, which has um, uh, invested about $2 billion. So they, this happened, all of this stuff happened, um, you know, uh, 2000 and, uh, between 2011 and 2014. Um, and Australia was moving along at a cracking pace to address our, uh, our, our climate concerns. And unfortunately, we had a change in government and that seriously stalled. <laughs> but now things are shifting and we're starting to get back on track again. And I want to talk to you now about agriculture's role uh, in this decarbonisation task. So you may have heard on the news there's a lot of discussion around something called the safeguard mechanism. And the safeguard mechanism is essentially Australia's cap and trade system or emissions trading system. It's just not called that. Uh, the safeguard mechanism was brought in by the, uh, the Abbott government um, along with another policy called um, the Emissions Reduction Fund. But it has a history that goes back right back to 2007 and the beginning of the development of Australia's carbon markets policies, legislation and infrastructure. So when we're talking about the safeguard mechanism, we're talking about not the energy sector's decarbonisation, we're talking about the industrial sector's decarbonisation task in Australia. Um, and the policy is for a 43% economy-wide emissions reduction by 2030. It's supported by a few pieces of legislation, um, the National Greenhouse and Energy Reporting Act of 2007, the Safeguard Mechanism, which you will be very much hearing about, and also the Carbon Farming Initiative Act of 2011. It's administer administered by the Clean Energy Regulator, and receives support through the Emissions Reduction Fund, which is a $2 billion federal government fund. Now, what's very interesting here is that Australia, way back in 2011, recognised its competitive advantage uh, in terms of decarbonising the economy is due to the fact of the enormous land base that we have. So our land base is actually a sink <laughs> that when managed uh, for those outcomes can remove enormous amounts of carbon from the atmosphere and store that carbon in the soil and achieve a whole heap of other co-benefits. And this is reflected in the Carbon Farming Initiative Act that was established in 2011, and now the safeguard mechanism. So you would have been hearing about offsets a lot and the use of off offsets and a lot of controversy around <coughs> that. But what is recognised is that industrial sectors, um, the technology that they need to decarbonise is not necessarily commercially viable or economically viable right now. Um, and the business case to transition these industrial facilities into low carbon um, uh, operations um, is a very difficult business case to prosecute. On the other hand, the capacity for Australia to remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and, and, and address our emissions that way is something that can be done right now and there's a very compelling business case to do it and we have a competitive advantage in that space. So um, you would have also noticed that Australian farmers don't seem to be in any way um, on the hook uh, under any policy to reduce their emissions. There is bipartisan political support to have hands off agriculture in Australia which is a really, really wonderful thing for farmers. Basically what's happening is farmers are being offered the carrot and everybody else is being offered the stick. And I'm going to start talking to you about some of the carrots 
that are being fed, well, being offered to farmers. <laughs> and, and also a little bit of a reason why. So um, the reason why <laughs> is because Australian politicians know that if they try and smack an Australian farmer over the head, they're going to get what for. <laughs> and um, hopefully they have learned from the lessons from the Netherlands, Sri Lanka and New Zealand. I don't know if any of you have been following what's been happening in the rest of the world, but um, it's not a very good idea to um, whack farmers over the heads with sticks. So moving on a little bit further, we talked about um, Australia's competitive advantage. And if you have a look at the, the um, the map of Australia there, you'll see all of those, all of the land in Australia that's managed by farmers, right? 60% of the Australian land mass is managed by farmers. It's literally in your hands. And your management <coughs> of that land can achieve some incredible outcomes for the ecology, for human health, for animal health, and for just as important, importantly, the resilience and the bottom line um, of, of, your, of your farming enterprises. But what's even more exciting, and this comes from a CSIRO report, is that the economic potential for Australian farmers to remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere is around 130 million tonnes per year. 130 million tonnes per year is the economic potential. And then when you subtract that from the actual industrial emissions of Australian industry, we can see that Australian farmers can pretty much provide the service of removing all of that pollution from the atmosphere that the industrial sector produces in their, in their land. It's simply an enormous internationally competitive opportunity for, for our, our trade, Australia, our, our trade relations, and an amazing economic opportunity for farmers as well. But it doesn't stop here. We talk a lot about carbon, but carbon and biodiversity are interrelated, right? They're one in the same problem. And the government knows that too. So what's coming is another carrot. And that carrot includes payments to farmers for biodiversity, uh, for repairing, enhancing, restoring and regenerating uh, remnant bushland, um, building, building wildlife cor corridors. Um, and that is underpinned called by a piece of legislation that is going through Parliament now called the Nature Repair Market. Uh, and this Nature Repair Market will also pay you for those services that you deliver to society. <coughs> but there is a stick. And the stick is coming from our our international trade relations, and most specifically under what's called the Carbon Border Adjustment Mechanism, which has been put in place in the European Union and will be, in, will be active this year, um, starting uh, to tax uh, high energy intensive uh, goods like cement, steel and fertiliser, but it will most definitely extend into agriculture. Right, so what will happen is if you have not addressed your carbon footprint within Australia, when you uh, go to export or someone goes to import your product, they will have to pay um, that tax. So there's an opportunity for you to address your carbon footprint here, increase the, the, the resilience, the profitability of your farming enterprise and earn income for doing that. Then there's another big picture here. <laughs> and this is in relation to the people who are buying the commodities that you produce. So, uh, you know, 70%, actually, I don't, 
maybe 90% of West Australian grain is exported. Someone might know, <coughs> not know better than me on that one. Um, and it's being exported to big multinational companies, Kellogg's, PepsiCo. And these big companies are making uh, voluntary uh, net zero targets, including their scope three emissions. I'm going to talk about that in a little minute. Uh, and these, uh, uh, d these, these targets are being driven by legislation um, and reporting standards under various standards. I'm not going to get you bored with that. <laughs> um, but, but I think importantly, um, in the US in particular, um, the SEC, the Securities and Investment Commission of, of America, is um, instructing uh, big multinational companies that they must report on their scope three emissions. Right? So reporting leads to being aware of a risk in that domain, which feeds into uh, fiduciary duty and obviously a responsibility to address that risk. So I'll just very quickly talk about the scopes. So we have three scopes of emissions within a farming operation. The first scope is generally what happens behind your farm gate. So we're talking about uh, fuel use, fertiliser, lime, <coughs> uh, burning. These are the main uh, scopes that sit behind the fa farm gate. Then you have scope two, which is generally energy consumption or on your farm, which is very small in the case of most agricultural operations. And then you have scope three. And scope three is uh, the emissions involved in producing the fertilisers and pesticides, et cetera, that you use, use on your property. Now, your scope one, two, and three is someone else's scope three emissions, right? So when you address your scope one emissions by changing your farming practice, practices, reducing your, your, your energy intensity on your farming operation, right, you become well, ultimately, we want to get to net zero, so we want to become carbon neutral, right? But also, whoever you're selling that commodity to also gets the deduction of that um, carbon dioxide liability from their balance sheet. This, these scope things are a little bit <coughs> complex, so um, don't, don't, don't get too het up on that. But it's quite a significant thing to understand because... These big corporations that are purchasing your commodities uh, need your help to address their carbon footprints and carbon emissions. Um, and they also understand that a stick is not going to get your help to do that. So they are starting to invest hundreds of millions of dollars supporting farmers to take, make these changes and um, address their, their carbon emissions. So this goes to essentially what this presentation is about. And this presentation is about how we decarbonise your farming operation. And it involves a change in management of carbon, nitrogen and biodiversity. Thank you.